All right, we are now on lecture 13, and we are continuing to work on analyzing data. So we saw how pandas can be useful for analyzing data, and that was for analyzing CSV type files. So um, this could also include things like Excel files, uh, but this is some sort of like tabular data. So another very common type of data that you might need to analyze are called arrays. So we've seen lists, and lists are useful for storing elements, um, and, and lists are kind of like a Pythonic version of an array, but they are not super efficient, so they aren't designed to be very fast, and they're also not very useful for handling multi-dimensional data. And so this is where NumPy comes in. So NumPy is built on a C library, and it is designed to be much more efficient. Um, so it's efficient both in terms of the memory requirement, so how much RAM it takes to store data, uh, and then faster processing time as well. So it's much faster in terms of data analysis, operations, that sort of thing. And so if you're doing anything that is, is kind of at the edge of, of um, you know, if it's a large data set uh, that requires kind of very intense operations to act upon it, then typically you want to use NumPy over, over any sort of list. And so there are a lot of different things that you can do with NumPy, and so some of the different things are just listed right here. So you start with your array of data, and then you can do arithmetic operations, statistical operations, etc., cetera, uh, matrix operations. So if you do any sort of linear algebra, if you want to calculate eigenvalues, eigenvectors, uh, decompositions, NumPy can do a lot of this stuff for you. And then also like searching, sorting, and counting are all, all things that, that NumPy is useful for. They have a lot of built-in functions to do that and it's also very efficient. So we've seen lists before, so lists are containers of multiple elements. And so NumPy is similar. So you can have a one-dimensional array, and so this is very similar to a list. So this length of this array is four, so there's four different elements, seven, two, nine, and 10. But you can also have a 2D array, so this is sometimes called a matrix, and so a 2D array has, has data in two dimensions. So this is also very useful for storing data in, uh, for a matrix, um, or also if you're looking at something like we saw before um, with like depth data, so that depth data was like a spatial 2D spatial view. And so a NumPy 2D array is very useful for storing that data. It's also very useful for storing data like images, so images are 2D arrays of, of data. And then finally, it can also store 3D arrays. So 3D arrays are, are often referred to as tensors, and 3D arrays are useful for storing things like video data, for example, or any sort of volumetric data. And so each of these arrays has a shape and also a dimension. So the dimension of this is one, and the shape of this is four. So the, the number of elements in this direction is four. For the 2D array, the dimension is two, and we have to specify the size of each dimension. So along axis zero, there are two, the length of this is two, and then along the other dimension it's three. So the shape of this is two, three, and then for the 3D array we have to specify the dimension in all, in all three. So four, three, and two. All right, so a lot of the intuition that you built up and a lot of the, the syntax that you learned on using Python lists can be extended to NumPy arrays. So Let's go into Python, and if you don't have NumPy installed yet, you'll definitely have to install that using conda. So conda install, um, and then uh, NumPy is the name of the library. So I've already installed this, so I don't need to do that. And so I'm going to import it um, is the first thing that I want to do. So again, the, the common way that people import NumPy is to rename it as NP. So I'm gonna follow that. So this is similar to importing pandas as PD. And if we want to first create a uh, array, 
the way we do that is using this array type object. So what this does is it creates a numpy array, array and this is an ND array is the class type. So this is a um, multi-dimensional array. So an N dimensional array because we can create as many dimensions as we want. So we've seen one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, but you can also extend it to four, five, six. You know, this is, this is very generalizable. This object is very generalizable to handle any sort of dimensional array. So we talked before, there's, there's um, some common attributes of any um, array. So one of these is the dimension of the array. So here we've created a one dimensional array, array using this. And we can see that, so if we <coughs> look at all of the different attributes and methods of this, one of, the, one of these is called ndim. And so this just lists the, the dimension of the array. So if you ever want to know the dimension of the array, you can do that using this attribute. Um, you can also get the shape of the array. So the attribute shape stores the uh, shape of the array. And so this is stored as a tuple. So if you ever wanted to get the actual element, you would have to use the indexing operator to get to the first element of the tuple. So shape is always stored as a tuple no matter what. Um, and then finally, one thing that is different and unique about numpy arrays compared to lists is that all of the elements of an array have to be the exact same data type. And so for lists, you know, there was a lot of flexibility. The first element could be an integer, the second one could be a float, the third one could be a string, the fourth one could be a list. So you had a lot of flexibility where each element of the list could be a unique thing. So the way that numpy is so efficient the way it takes a lot less memory, the way it has much faster processing, is that it needs every single element to be the exact same data type. So we didn't specify when we created this array what sort of data type that we wanted to use, but it implicitly tried to figure out what we wanted. And this is stored in dtype. So this, this attribute called dtype stands for data type. And so we can see that what is stored is something called an int64. So there are much, there are there are a few different data types that we can use in NumPy, um, and so a, a table of all these is listed right here. So if you look these over, these are the names um, of the data type. So in 64 um, is what we've seen right here, and what you should notice is that these data types are very similar in some ways to the numerical types that we've already encountered in Python. So there's a Boolean type in Python, there's an integer type in Python, there's a float type in Python, and there's a complex type in Python. Um, but there's a lot more flavors of each of these except for Boolean in, in, in NumPy. So this again gets at efficiencies. So um, why do we have all of these different data types? So int8, int16, int32, int64. What distinguishes these is how many bytes or bits of data is used to store each value. And so this again helps us really nail down the efficiency. So for example, if we wanted to create the smallest type um, array as possible, how much RAM it will take. So let's say we're like dealing with something like a huge video, we might want to compress that data as much as possible to read all of it into RAM. And so what we want to use is the data type that can handle our data, uh, but is the smallest size available. And what this eight tells us is how many bits it actually is. So, so int eight, um, is an integer, but it can only store integers between negative 128 and 127. So if you tried to store it, you know, a thousand, you would get an error um, or something un unexpected would occur. And so kind of how this works is that each bit supplies two different options. So if you were storing a data, it would be either a zero or a one, and then you would have eight versions of that. So if you remember base two, if, you're, if you remember kind of the elementary school or junior high school work on base, different bases, you know, the way computer store information is in base two, and so that indicates that there's an int eight has eight different bits that it's using. So 
there's a total of 256 values that it, that that can be stored within that. And so if you count how many integers are between negative 128 to 127, there's 256 values that kind of range uh, within that. And so that's how an int 8 works. So whatever your data is, you just need to make sure that your data object can handle it. So the largest integer class is int 64, and this can handle data between negative, um, and so this is a typo, I think, um, within there. So 9.22e to the 18th to 9.22e to the 18th. So the, the largest one has a huge range of integer values um, that, that it can handle. <coughs> So for example, if you were storing uh, the number of hours you were sleeping each night, you know, the most, the most that that could be is, is 24 or 16 or 12 or something like that. So um, in that case, you know, you don't need to have an N64 to store that data. The range of negative 128 to 127 would be perfectly reasonable for that. Uh, but if you were a runner and you're interested in, in keeping track of um, uh, how many days you ran each year. So that could range between 0 and 365. And so an int 8 wouldn't be sufficient to handle the range of your data. And so you'd have to make sure you use an int 16. So um, uints, unsigned ints um, are very similar. They have 8 bits of data. Um, but negative values are not allowed. And so instead of ranging between negative 128 to 127, the range of an unsigned int, the U stands for unsigned, is between 0 and 255. Um, so for example, this data class is used for storing RGB values um, for color data. So if you have an image, a JPEG, or something like that, um, each pixel has an R, a red, a green, and a blue value that can range between 0 and 255. So uint8 is very commonly used in order to store data for JPEGs or images. And then there's a couple different values of floats um, and a couple of different values for complex, you know, that, that ranges upon the size. You know, in general, you won't have to worry too much about this um, unless you start to run into issues where you don't have enough RAM in order to store the data, and then you might want to modify it. Or if you're trying to keep things as small as possible, like if you have a really large data set and you don't want to, um, and you want to kind of minimize the hard drive sta spa stage, hard drive space that it takes, um, then you might want to customize this. And so you can also specify. Um, what data type you want when you create the array um, by using this optional a uh, argument called dtype. So we say we want to create a, a, an array out of this list of these values and you know, we want to use the float 128. And so now we see that our array, the data type is float 128. Um, you can also change um, an array. So you know, we, we created this data object before, which is an N64, and if we wanted to change the type that it was stored in, it has this method called as type. Um, so we could also use this to change um, and create a new array where every single element is a float instead. So the numbers are all the same as before, so 1, 3, 4, 2, and 0. Um, but you know, each one is now a float object instead of an integer object. So as type is kind of the way that you would do that. All right, we also can create uh, multi-dimensional arrays. Um, and so one way that we can do that is again using lists. Um, and so here you can see I have a list of lists. So I have a list and the first element of the list is another list um, with the values 2, 3, and 4. And then the second element of that first list is a list with the values 1, 5, and 6. So I can use this in order to create a two-dimensional array. And so data 2, so now we see that it's actually a two-dimensional array where the first row is 2, 3, and 4 and the second row is 1, 5, and 6. And um, you know if we look at the dim oh, sorry, data two is the name of it. So if we look at the dimension of it, we see that it's now equal to two. And then if we look at the shape of it, we see that it's a two by three. So the number of rows is two, and then the number of columns is three. You can also, you know, this gets even more uh, kind of difficult to write out, but you can also um, create a three-dimensional array by doing a list of lists of lists. 
Um, so I've written that out here. Uh, and so now we can see that this is what a three-dimensional um, list looks like. So we can confirm that the dimensionality is three, and we can confirm that the shape, there's three different dimensions. It's a two by two by two. Um, so very straightforward, uh, not very straightforward. It's straightforward, but you know, in general, you might not want to create uh, multi-dimensional uh, um, array, arrays this way, um, but it's totally, totally reasonable or totally possible to do it that way. Um, so you can also create arrays with specific values. Um, so for example, if you wanted to create an array with a defined shape, um, where every single element was equal to zero. Um, there's this function called zeros. And what it takes is a shape. So we can give it whatever shape we want. So we can specify we want a three-dimensional array because we've specified three dimensions um, where the first dimension is three, the length of the second is three, and the length of the third dimension is four. And again, we can also specify the exact data type we want out of that. So you'll notice that we've created um, an array with the appropriate shape um, where each element is initialized to zero. Um, similarly, you can create a uh, you can create an array where every one every single value is one using this. Uh, function called numpy ones and so now you can see every single element is, is equal to one and then finally if you want to specify a unique value you can use this function called full and full takes in a op an argument called fill value and so this just specifies what we want every element to be equal to um, so you might use this you might use these functions to create a brand new array, and if you need it to all have the same value, you know you can do that. Uh, but if you don't, then then you know you can go in and modify the data as appropriate. So sometimes it's easier to start out with the with an object that has the appropriate shape, and then go in and modify it as appropriate. All right, so that is the basics of arrays. Um, so we've seen how to create the arrays. Um, and we've also seen kind of the, the primary attributes of each array that are important. So the dimensionality, the shape, and then the data type. Um, so those are important things to always keep in mind when you're, when you're using these types of arrays.